Ben's Book, bringing you the world of women and books on Network Listen, starts now. Hello, hello, and welcome to Ben's Book. I'm your host, Sean Marie Bryan. We have pulled down from Ben's Bookshelf and Anthony. Anthology. We don't often see a lot of anthologies on Ben's book. And it's called, are you ready for this fun, fun title? Jesse's ready. Uh. <laughs> Jesse can't wait. We are going to discuss lesbians on the loose, crime writers on the lamb. And to join me in this discussion are one L'Oreal Lake, woo! And one Jesse Chandler. Dun, dun, dun. If you want to learn more about Lori Lake and Jesse Chandler, they each have websites, L'OrealLake.com and JesseChandler.com. Today, we're all about this anthology. Tell me, you esteemed editors, what inspired you? What brought you together to make this anthology happen? We like mysteries. And we like mystery writers. And we like mystery writers all together. And we like short stories, which you don't see very many of. And we like long stories, too. But since we don't see short stories, we decided to put them all in a big book. Nice. So we've got a big book. It's an anthology. It's not that big. Don't be intimidated. Get this book. It's on Amazon, right? Is it on your websites as well? No, but it's on Barnes and Noble and Kobo and um, you know various other places. I've picked it up to sell it in both print and ebook. So you should be able to find this wherever you shop for a book. And if it isn't there, ask for it, and they can order it. So the two of you got together and you decided this was a book that was needed. Are there not many mystery anthologies out there? There really aren't, and so we thought we might try and correct that problem. Well, there are some, but they're not lesbian-oriented. And so we wanted ones that had lesbian heroes and spies and uh, various other sundry, crazy people doing crime and that sort of thing. People just like us. (laughs) People just like you. Speaking of people, how did you, did you put a call for submissions? Did you call up all of your favorite writers and say, hey, give me a story? How did it come to be that you assembled this cast of characters within this book? We asked around mostly. Uh, Jesse, you you found a couple of people, and I basically found the rest at the Golden Crown Literary Convention. I talked to several people, and so we ended up with fifteen authors, including Jesse and me. So, thirteen other people who are really very good authors. Like, well, should I just tell who all the authors are? Okay, absolutely. Hold on, we're we're going to come back. But yeah, no, absolutely. Let's do the roll call. Andy Marquette, Carson Tate. Elizabeth Sims. Jen Wright. Me, Jesse Chandler. J.M. Redman. Cake McLaughlin. Catherine V. Forrest. Linda M. Vogt. And then me. L'Oreal Lake. <laughs> Lynn Ames. Sandra DeHelen. Sue Hardesty. S.Y. Thompson. And V.K. Powell. Who is last but not least. Last but not least, that is quite the array of authors and some of them who write more than mysteries. Uh, But for the most part, these are some really premier lesbian mystery writers and a really impressive compilation. You've got um, Catherine V. Forrest and Sue Hardesty, you know, who have really just been pioneers and champions and like putting this together on both ends of the spectrum you've got some new people in there that have just started to publish and just started to write oh my gosh yeah so linda m vote was this her first publication after uh, she wrote one novel so she's the one person who really has just embarked on a career everybody else has multiple novels three or i think three or more yes that is correct <laughs> Like, Jesse is our fact finder. <laughs> That's fantastic. But what I also like about this is that there are some people on here, even though they're really prominent as lesbian mystery writers or lesbian authors in general, you don't get to see them as much. Like, they don't necessarily get profiled or spotlighted, if that makes sense. Like, um, I love that J.M. Redmond is on there. You know, I, I think that we take for granted that she's always just going to be there in writing. And instead of celebrating her whenever she does do something, hold on one second, Lori's got something to say on that. Well, I just have to reiterate what a wonderful 
writer that J.M. Redman is. And people know her as being somewhat funny, but also really serious in her Mickey Knight series. However, the story in this collection is called The Curious Case of the Disappearing Dildos. (laughs) That sounds fantastic. And if that isn't a reason for you to buy the book, there is nothing else that can top that. (laughs) Well, maybe, maybe there's something else that could top that. Or bottom it. Whoa, now we're talking. Now we're talking which way do you wear your bandana? <laughs> okay, so, so right, so you've got J.M. Redman, you've got Catherine Forrest. Oh my gosh, Elizabeth Sims. Should we talk about Elizabeth Sims? Let's talk Elizabeth. Elizabeth is fantastic. She's a great writer, and she has been a real champion for lesbian writers, including a writing a Writer's Digest uh, series for years. So she's she's great. What I know and love about Elizabeth Sims, and I don't know her as the two of you know her, I only know of her work, her craft, if we're being lofty, is that she's not afraid to put in the real gritty characters. She's not afraid to be real, to show a bad, you know, a bad influence, um, at least every now and then. And I really like that. She's got that sort of off-the-cuff noir, but modern-day like combination that's really fantastic. You mean bad girls, bitches, and bamboozlers? <laughs> yes, but I could not say it nearly as well as you could. That was fantastic. You want to do that again? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do mean that. I mean that entirely. Also, I enjoy that Andy Marquette is in here. Um, does a great job of really capturing exactly how moments feel with how she paints a story and how she incorporates the ambiance of that. I would agree. She's uh it's an 80s kickback and the little details that she adds in make it so real and so much fun. Plus the character in Andy's story is I think around 16 or 17, mm-hmm. so it's almost kind of a young adult story in a way but with a kind of adult twist to it. So it, 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 that's a very good story. Also, I wanted to point out um maybe my only bit of inside information with this anthology is that Kate McLaughlin's story, the main character, Beatrice, is also in her novel, Ten Little Lesbians. So you get to see this other side of Beatrice. If you've read Ten Little Lesbians, you get to see another side of her or more of her, let's say, like a little more in depth in this story. Did you guys know that? I did. There's um, kind of a double dose of mystery in this compact story that she wrote called Seasons of Deception. Uh, Not only is there a mystery that has to do with um, the neighbor who's disappeared and she's worried about him, and Beatrice is a judge, and so she's all about law and right and wrong and so forth. But there's also some personal mystery that gets revealed that's really cool. I, I can't, I don't want to do a spoiler, so I can't tell you anything about it. You just have to trust that it's really cool. Nice. And you're also super hip, man. You've got Lynn Ames and Carson Tate. Well, and Carson just won the Alice B. Award for her body of work because she's got a lot of stuff that she has written, uh, some great novels, great thrillers, romantic intrigue, all kinds of good stuff. She's just uh, really well thought of. And so the Alice B. people have given her that award. Right. And just a while, because it got brought up, Alice B., can you tell us if that's for a body of work, not just a single volume? There's, Is that correct? There's multiple things, I think. Well, there's actually two, if you can want to call that multiple. Two times one, that's a multiple. So, sure. yeah. uh, uh, one, and, Jesse, and Jesse speak, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's the Alice B. medal, which comes with a $500 gift and a really cool medal that's engraved with your name. And then there's also the Lavender Certificate, which is for debut authors who have put out a book that's really great. And uh, the Alice B. Ladies, a group of, um, well, nobody knows who they are. In fact, I've never met any but one of them. And I administer it for them and send out messages and try to help them find everybody. And uh, so I I don't know who all these um, 
little old ladies are, I think, that, that read. I, all I know is they live in Arizona somewhere, and if anyone wants to go on some kind of a sleuthing trip with me to track them down, then let me know. Okay, that sounds absolutely fantastic and completely perfect for this anthology because it's a mystery award. It's <laughs> all anonymous. Do you get your email communications with them in code? Because <laughs> <laughs> she has a secret decoder ring, and then she has to take her shoe off, and in the sole of her shoe, she's got the little special thing that makes the code ring work. Fantastic. That's nice. Yeah. All right. So we are here with Loria Lake and Jesse Chandler talking about the anthology they edited, Lesbians on the Loose, Crime Writers on the Lam. We will be right back. Afra Ben, spy, Tory, playwright, and the first woman to be paid as a writer with her own name ignited the inspiration for Ben's book. Lesbians on the Loose. Elizabeth Sims, Carson Tate, S.Y. Thompson, Andy Marquette, Linda M. Vogt, V.K. Powell, Kate McLaughlin, Lori L. Lake, Lynn Ames, Sandra DeHelen, Jen Wright, Sue Hardesty, Jesse Chandler, J.M. Redman, Catherine V. Forrest, Crime Writers on the Lamb, ready to keep you up way past your bedtime. We're back with Ben's book and L'Oreal Lake and Jesse Chandler. We're discussing the cast of characters that fill out the crime mystery lesbian writers anthology, Lesbians on the Loose, Crime Writers on the Lamb, and we've been discussing all of the authors within it, and we're moving down the cast of characters. Who's up next? Do we want to talk about Jen Wright? She did one of the few stories that was set out in the wilderness. Uh, I think that hers was, wasn't it the only one that was set out yeah. out of doors? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but it was up in the boundary waters of Minnesota. Oh, very I cool. Michigan. I think it was Michigan, wasn't it? Was it Minnesota? Okay. It's a mystery M state. We'll know. we'll discover. Readers, let us know and it's, send us an email. Keep us in line. <laughs> it's a state starting with an M. Yes, that's right. I think it is Minnesota. I think you're right. I, I think so. Excellent. And S.Y. Thompson is in this. Well, S.Y. Thompson and V.K. Powell both have uh, experience in law enforcement. So they were, uh, they, they did some really good mystery kind of stuff. Because throughout the course of this book, we've got uh, cops and amateur sleuths. We've got a P.I., a judge, a bounty hunter, and one very insightful dog. That was Lynn Ames' story. And uh, it's told from the dog's point of view. And not only is it very funny, but it's just so good. It's just a hoot. So the, the dogs are a great personality. Nice. A barking good time. <laughs> awesome. Who else have we got? The one person we talked mentioned just briefly, Linda Vogt, um, she's from here in Oregon, and uh, this was her first story she ever wrote, and hers was the one story that was actually based on a true story about two women who went to a dance kind of place, and when they came out, they got kidnapped. And the story of what happens to them uh, during the course of that. So hers was more of like a, like a thriller almost. It was almost good. like true crime, yeah. almost to a yeah. degree. Yeah. Wow, I love that. I love that. A little Truman Capote-esque happening in here. That's what I know of true crime <laughs> in cold blood. <laughs> That's all right. That was good. That was good. Yeah. Uh, and then, then Sandra De Helen, who recently moved to San Diego, I think. She moved down she into... Went south. She went moved, south. Yeah, she went south with the birds. Um, she went down there, I think, because of allergies and... Um, Wow, she she wrote a fun story set in a hotel, and hers kind of it was funny. Um, the main character's name is um, Helen Black, isn't that it? I think. Yeah, that sounds right. Yes. Yeah. yeah uh huh. There was a joke about that in there. Do you remember the joke about? Uh, I I don't. But then again, I can't remember what I ate ten minutes ago. So we're good. <laughs> we're all good. There was no eating. There was no eating ten minutes ago. You've been with us for more than ten minutes. Yeah, we we are starving, Jesse Chandler. She doesn't get to eat while I we're... I get hangry if I don't eat. But we're talking about books, so I think that's okay. feeding your soul. True. It is. I'm good. Yeah, we are all good. Yeah, the part was, uh, she's, Helen Black is my name. Go ahead, make the joke. I've heard it all of my life. You look like Helen Black and not so great in white either. Har, har, har. Ha, <laughs> ha, nice. Play on words, play on color, play on mystery. 
Well, actually, the, then it goes on. So guess what color I wear every day? And guess how many kids got a black eye? Courtesy of Helen Black when I was in school. I told them they didn't look so good in black either. Har, har, har. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So I think we've talked about all of the authors, except the two of you. So each of you, in addition to being editors, has a story in this anthology. Is that correct? Yes, it's true. And actually, both Jesse's and my stories are revenge stories. Revenge stories. Do they incorporate any other characters from any of your other works? Or are they complete standalone stories? It's a complete standalone story for me, which is unusual because almost every short story I write is a riff off of one of my characters. And mine are not uh, other stories that I've written or or novels either. So they're both, both of us just thought up something out of the blue. Nice. Oh, that's great. So Lori gave us a little taste of what's inside the book between the covers. Do we want to explore and read a few excerpts to tease listeners even more? Woo-hoo! I think Jessie is fine with that. How do you feel about that, Lori? Uh, she's a better teaser than I am, apparently. <laughs> a better teaser. Well, I can read the excerpts. And we cho- <laughs> we chose we chose some fun ones um, before we even sat down. And I, I like them a lot because they kind of, they don't leave out the sort of, ooh, like you know right away that there there could be a crush in these stories as well, which is always a nice additive that I feel, you know, Especially in lesbian mystery writing, there's definitely, you know, somebody that someone's in love with or somebody's interested in more so than mainstream heterosexual male mysteries. I don't think I'm off base in making sure that that is kind of part of what lesbian mystery writers tend to include in their stories more so. Well, you are off and off base, but not about that one. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you're right. I, I mean, one of the reasons I think people read lesbian novels, lesbian stories, is because they resonate with them. And so much of the mainstream press doesn't have lesbians much. And if they do, often they're kind of inaccurately characterized. Or, you know, we all end up being axe murderers and, you know, devious uh, heart rippers and whatever, just terrible characters. So uh, I think you're right. That's great. So, um, dear sweet listeners, Lori Lake and I may actually know each other in real life. Wait, wait, I know. Not I, in the biblical sense. Not in the biblical sense at all. Not in the biblical sense at all. But that's why she feels she can say that I'm off base. Yeah, that's what she's doing right there. So, Jesse, thank you so much. Jesse's helping me open a book. We are coming to you from uh, what I like to call my studio wallapini, a very tiny space in Oregon. And it's cozy. <laughs> it's cozy. It's it's. Uh, I have had living room tents when I was a child that were bigger than this. Yes. But you know, we like each other. It's going to be fine. I'm going to have to ask Jesse to hold that book for a minute because I'm going to put the mic in a stand for my ability to read this for you all. So the first one that we're going to touch on is Untold Riches by Elizabeth Sims. I couldn't believe they used real money in class. I'd expected play money, not the kind for children, but adult play money, near real money with basic markings that's regulation size. Phony coins I expected, too. But there we were, a dozen brand new teller trainees up to our elbows in the real thing, $10,000 of it. The trainer, a bored veteran of human resources, had counted it out before our eyes. This was the job for me, finally. I believe that was the bank's first mistake. Moreover, though, I thought I'd forgotten how to flirt. Lord, it had been years, my prime sliding away from me like a wad of bacon grease across a hot skillet. But I hadn't forgotten. No, I sure hadn't. I'd been unable to take my eyes off of Giselle Brigsby from the minute she set her sleek little butt in the chair kitty corner from mine. Unlike the rest of the class, Women who were dressed as if for hooker tryouts, Giselle wore black slacks that just missed the category of jean styling, forbidden. A black turtleneck against the prairie chill and a spring green leather belt that slithered around her hips like a friendly python. The shoes, well-worn Doc Martens, black, of course. 
She was a dewy little baby dyke whose attempts at looking and acting tough made the tips of my toes ache. And on top of it all, her parents had had the miraculous sense to name her Giselle. Alva Johnson, the trainer, butchered it. Giselle, Bigsby? President, answered Giselle, little smart mouth. At break, I staggered to the washroom and sat whispering, Giselle, Giselle. On leaving, I avoided my eyes in the mirror, my accusing eyes that, had I met them, would have asked, Who in God's name do you think you are? You've got fifteen years on her, at least. Your breasts sag and your bangs are cut crooked. Yeah, but I had a new job, one I wasn't going to blow. A job that could lead to something. My self-esteem was at a high level. So next break, lunchtime, Giselle happened to be right ahead of me, going into the cafeteria, holding the door open, and I happened to place my warm, loving hand over hers for an instant. My lips are full and sensuous, and I sort of swirled a smile right into her fresh, startled face. From then on, I noticed her noticing me. Okay, so the story continues, and they continue with their training, and we learn that Giselle probably wants to be liked but is trying to be nonchalant about it and then at the end of the day they have to turn their money back in you guys remember this part of the story they're looking at me like they know they know everything that's happening and here's the fun part well I'm just going to read it because it's, it's way more fun Giselle and I were working at adjacent windows and Alva Johnson had just told us to turn in our drawers for the day when I saw Giselle's hand slipped from her drawer to her front pocket. She stuffed a bill in. She licked her lips. Just as she glanced toward me, I looked away. A thrill ran through me. The kids got guts. Who knew that the day's routine would end with Alva Johnson consolidating all our cash drawers and counting the money again while we watched? She counted it once, looked up, pressed her lips together, then counted it again. She sighed heavily and said, <sighs> A $20 bill is missing. No one spoke. Everyone remain seated, please. She pulled her chair from behind her table to sit facing us square. Whoever has the 20, bring it to me. Silence. From my window side view seat, I watched Giselle run her tongue over her teeth, trying to decide whether to be amused or scared. Class, this is disappointing, said Alva. We all have to wait here until whoever has the 20 comes forward. My classmates, except Giselle, shifted and groaned. We sat in silence for six years. Then I had a sudden thought. My wallet was in my coat pocket, which was hanging on the back of my chair. I made a loud, real-sounding sneeze, then fumbled in my coat pocket as if for a Kleenex. A minute later, I bent down to look under my chair. Oh, what's this? I cried, holding up a 20. What the heck? Giselle's head snapped around, and she gazed at me in total awe. Alva, narrow-eyed, took the twenty. Everybody waits until I check the serial number. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't get away with it that time. So we're going to take just one more quick little break, and we'll be back with another excerpt. You're listening to Ben's book. We'll be right back. Special Agent Kellen McKenna and her National Protection and Investigation Unit partners are drawn into a case that started with a pair of school shootings in Minneapolis. They learn that a hate group is recruiting teenagers on school grounds, handing out metal music rife with violent messages, and plotting a terrorist offensive on a major Twin Cities venue. Kaylin soon finds herself in a fight for her life, and the clock is ticking. Can she prevail in time to stop the worst terror attack that Minnesota has ever seen? Find out in Jesse Chandler's Operation Stop Hate. Welcome back to Ben's book. Boy, I wish you all could be in the tight little studio with us to see how Jesse Chandler just turned a microphone into kind of a weapon. I'm not really sure what that was, but uh, we're here and we are inside Lesbians on the Loose. Inside. Inside, yes. 
crime writers on the lam. Last segment, we read through a little bit of Elizabeth Sims' story. Now we're going to pick up into Andy Marquette's story, which is set in the 80s, as we mentioned before. And she does a really, really great job of painting the picture very early on in the story with the main character's friend, Fred, who's kind of going through a Simon Le Bon stage. So those of you old enough to know Duran Duran, I'm sure already feel what Fred might be going through at this moment. Lori, Lori's facial expressions right now tell me that she is so in the know of this and she's looking at me very suspiciously. I never liked Duran Duran, sorry to say. Oh my good, oh, contention in the ranks within the words. And you were crying when David Bowie died and I never liked him all that much either. So, you know, it's just different strokes for different folks. I actually cried more so for Alan Rickman. David Bowie, that's controversial, especially for women. Like he was not so nice to us for a while. But Alan Rickman was so good in Die Hard as Hans Gruber. Yes. And in Anthony Mangala's wonderful script that they turned into a movie truly madly deeply, really, really fantastic. Okay, so Ben's book going into pop culture there. At least we found a place where we could agree, Lori. Yes, that's true. Yes. Okay. It's all about coming together when we're talking about lesbian mystery writers, right, Jesse? Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Jesse's like, I'm staying neutral. Okay, so sadly, Andy Marquette's story does tell some truths of little bit of bullying and um, bordering on or definitely really close to bordering on uh, gay bashing. And we're going to pick up in the story a little bit after there's been a slight altercation with some of the icky poos uh, or maybe the popular set of the school who has taunted and slightly assaulted Fred. Slightly? Um, Okay. Okay. I'm just, I'm trying to leave some mystery here, Jesse. And do you want to set this up? No. (laughs) Okay. Well, she was doing a great job. So basically, luckily we get through the altercation. Um, A teacher comes out just in time and our heroine kind of steps in as well. And, you know, was saving the day before the teacher got there. So that's really fantastic. And her name is Joe. You can't go wrong the character named Joe. And right before the altercation, Fred was teasing Joe about having a crush on, no, I messed this up. Natty is is the main character and she has a crush on Joe. Still, you can't go wrong with either one of those names. So we're going to pick this up right as they've kind of had some nervous laughter to get through the unfortunate incident, which today they would file charges for. Okay. That, I think that or pleases Jesse. Or or kick him in the balls, as Jesse said. Yes. So we're picking it up right after that. And Fred is going off to class and Natty is there looking after him. She watched him since Josh was right down the hall leaning against a locker, but he was busy hanging all over. Natty stared a few more moments. Pam Howard? Pam was back with that jerk off? Gag. She checked to make sure Fred had gotten past Josh then went to class. Hey, Natty, Joe said as Natty approached the door to the biology classroom. She was leaning against the wall, holding her books in front, flat against her chest. She wore her basic Joe uniform, as Natty categorized it, loose jeans pegged at the ankles above her black high-top chucks, and a light blue t-shirt rolled up at the sleeves. She also wore a men's black vest over her shirt, which added to her boyish look, but in a good way. She had started streaking her dark hair blonde in the front, which only made her cuter. Hi, Natty hoped she sounded calm and cool. Got a sec? Joe pushed off the wall. Yeah. Oh my God. Joe stepped away from the doorway and the students filing in. She moved closer and lowered her voice. My mom's best show dog was stolen. I know, I heard. I'm really sorry. Um, so... Do you think you could help find him? I mean, if you want to. I wouldn't want you to get in trouble or anything. Natty stared at her. I mean, after the last time you solved something, I wasn't sure I should ask, but you're really good at finding stuff, so... Yes, she said, and immediately regretted it, but only a little. Her dad didn't have to know. Joe grinned. Really? Awesome. Could you come over after school today? Uh... Natty had never been inside Joe's house, and the thought made her nervous, but giddy, too. To see where it happened, the scene of the crime. Oh, yeah, awesome. Meet me after school by the parking lot. 
Natty followed her and took a seat on the opposite side of the room. Joe sat near the back, and Natty wished the order was reversed so she could see her during class. She opened her notebook and started listing potential suspects in Giorgio's dog napping and possible motives. Joe would have some ideas, too. She shoved the other thoughts she had of Joe out of her mind. This was an investigation, after all. <laughs> yeah, an investigation with teen angst. I can only imagine. Jesse? Yes, the teen angst is a problem, and it fires up all kinds of fun things. Well, and it's a good mystery. I think she should do a whole book of of stories where Natty is solving crimes right up into when she's an adult. She could have a whole series with that. Nice. Like a whole new Encyclopedia Brown, yeah. a whole new Cam Jansen. Encyclopedia Brown for the lesbians. Yeah. Well, was Encyclopedia Brown for the lesbians? No. But I read them all. I did too. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you'd be hard pressed not to. I mean, you've got okay. okay. How many? What did we have back then for you know inquiring Encyclopedia minds? Encyclopedia Brown with a lesbian protagonist. People. <laughs> oh, it would be Encyclopedia Brownie. I would go with Brownette. <laughs> okay, <laughs> nice. So, we gave you just tiny little snippets of two stories that are in there. Any other inclusions that you think could? spur something even grander. You mean uh, inclusions to the conversation or people we wish we'd gotten in here? Ooh, yeah. Well, let's get to the people you wish you'd gotten in there. But I was thinking of the material that is in Lesbians on the Loose. Do you think anything that started as a story in this might become something else? Isn't Carson Tate's uh, something, uh, doesn't she expand on that character or there's already a series about that character? I don't know. I, I, I'm I not sure about that. I know that uh, Catherine Forrest did the Kate Delafield story, which is also set back in time. Most of the stories are contemporary. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure about that. Uh, so I'm not sure. Okay. Well, we know that um, Kate McLaughlin in, incorporates a character from her novel, Ten Little Lesbians, the Kay Delafield, that's all incorporated, we're hoping. Andy Marquette expands on that. We've just given her a whole franchise. <laughs> right? Would you guys edit it? A uh, whole franchise of them? <laughs> possibly. Possibly. Yeah. 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 I'd be happy to edit just about anything Andy does. Yeah. And you had a chance to read the latest story that's uh, based on a Christmas story. Yes. And I don't remember the name, but it's fantastic. Bureau of Holiday Affairs? Yes, that's it. Bureau of Holiday Affairs is stupendous. Okay. Delightful. And you know that you pick it up just in time for Christmas. <laughs> you've got you've got some time to arrange for that. Um, so we've talked about what is included in this book. Why don't we take just a tiny little break? And when we come back, you can talk about what you had hoped was included or what this anthology inspired you to possibly spearhead off of. Ben's Book It's 1902, and Nell's run from the law takes her to a small railroad town. Nell assumes the identity of a schoolteacher and prepares to settle into the safety of anonymity. Meanwhile, she catches the loving eye of the lively lady doctor. Then, a man is murdered, and only Nell holds the clues that could lead to the killer. As Nell's past catches up to her, she struggles to keep it from destroying the wonderful new life she's made as alias Mrs. Jones by Kate McLaughlin. Lisa Ben, anagram, pen name, and the quote-unquote grandfather of the alternative press merges with Afra to round out the title for Ben's book. Welcome back. You are listening to Ben's book, and we are still deep between the covers of Lesbians on the Loose and deep next to each other in the smallest studio in the world. And we kind of left you hanging at the last little segment. And I'm going to let Lori and Jesse just take it from here with what they had hoped this book could have included. Uh, in other words, whom they hoped they could have gotten for it, and some of the trials and tribulations of putting that together in some that you thought maybe you could have gotten to contribute and then other things happened. But then also take it from there and tell me 
what maybe it's kind of inspired you to look forward to for possibly a future project. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the people we really wanted to include was Ellen Hart, but she was involved in uh, the middle of the current book that she was working on at the time and was unable to break away. So we were sad about that. And we also would have loved to have gotten Radcliffe, a story from Radcliffe, but she's just so busy publishing and writing on her own that there's just no way that she had time. And then uh, we also wanted to uh, talk to... We did We did talk to did Kate talk. Culpepper. We talked to Kate. And remember, and uh, Kate was very ill at the time, and she she said, "Well, you know, I kind of do paranormal mystery sort of stuff." And, and would you really want that? And we went, "Hell yeah!" And uh, but then she fell ill and contacted me later and said, "I I don't have the energy or time." And then Kate died. So uh, we really wish we would have had a story from her, you know, the penultimate story of her career. But we we she wasn't able to do it for us. But otherwise, I mean, we got some good people who are really excellent writers and they have been most generous with their storylines and their sense of humor. And it's been great to, it was great to edit that. Yeah. And it's also such a great thing. I think anthologies get a bum rap, but they can serve so many avenues. Like if you're curious about someone's writing and they're in an anthology, pick it up because you're going to get a little taste of it and you're going to know if you'll want to read more of them, even if it's not that same story. And then you're also getting 20 people for the price of one. Or 15 in this case. <laughs> or 15 in this case. But we've added the spirit of some more. So, you know, that would they were definitely there in the vision of the book and some really great people. Now, having said that, this is a great, this is a great cast, you know, of authors and everything like that. And... It's not your only anthology. Did it inspire you to do more anthologies? Well, one of the things Jesse and I want to do down the road is one that's a humor anthology. And she recently wrote a story for uh, submission to an anthology like that, and it got rejected. And it's a great story. So, uh, you know, it could kick off a whole anthology there. It was just rejected because there wasn't enough humor in it, so... Well, we can punch that up a little bit. You know, Sometimes dry humor gets mistaken for not being humorous. So I'm sorry that they weren't maybe able to see that there was more humor in it perhaps than it, they could tell. Uh, it worked out just fine. Uh, the story morphed into something different and it is uh, being used as a vehicle for garnering some uh, donations for a good cause. Oh, well, that's nice. Oh, I like that. That's yes. awesome. So that, that particular publisher took it and ran with it in a different direction, and I think it worked out fine. Okay, that's great. And that's kind of what we're talking about. Like when, when you have these projects and then they come to fruition and they're out there in the world, and then sometimes you're left with this lingering like, oh, well, I've done that. Now I could do this. Like I could move on with that. Lori, I think that happened for you, didn't it? Well, I really like anthologies and I like short stories. And there are so many good writers out there who you might not have ever heard of them before. But if you get an anthology, then you're introduced to that person. And I ran into Christopher Hawthorne Moss, who is a historical writer. And we met each other at uh, the Great Romance Meetup in Seattle a year and a half ago. And uh, he had some great ideas for doing a history anthology, which we ultimately ended up calling Time's Rainbow, writing ourselves back into history. Uh, actually, the first volume is American history, and the second one is world history. And we got some great stories from people that are all kinds of different time time periods where we're writing gay and lesbian people into the storyline of history, but not in a boring way. It's really, really good fiction. It's everything from the Portland tunnels and the 1880s to a Civil War story, and there's a story set during the Salem Witch Trials, which Kate McLaughlin did for us, and uh, just so many stories. I wrote about one of the civil rights leaders of the 1960s, Bayard Rustin, and um, 
it just turned into something that I'm going to be really proud of when we get it out. So I, I really like doing anthologies. I mean, you make no money on an anthology, really. Um, but it, it's just worth it because it's so vital that we have short fiction for people to read as well as longer fiction. Right. That's We'll have to have you back to discuss that anthology because that's completely perfect with Ben's book, who is named after Afra Ben and Lisa Ben. So two lesbian writers from our past. And the show honors them and their watershed ways for women writers. It just so happens that they both had leanings in that way. Woohoo! So, Jesse, um, other than writing that story and morphing into something even grander, which is totally cool, um, are you, do you see including things in anthologies in the future? Or was this like, whoa, that was a lot of work. I'm not sure anthologies are my ticket. Well, I'm not really a short story writer, but I have uh, contributed to a few short story anthologies in the past, and I've got another couple coming up. Um, and, you know, depending on what it is, I won't say no, but depending on what it is, I may. Okay. It's a mystery. Everything's a mystery where Jesse Chandler's concerned. So lesbians on the loose, crime writers on the lam. That's what we've been discussing. We didn't really want to discuss all of the stories because we want you to read them. They're short stories and we don't want to give away too much of them. We want you to run out and buy this book. As Lori mentioned earlier, it's on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Kobo. Um, and is it on Bella? Yes, I'm sorry I forgot. I'm very sorry I forgot Bella. Bella's been really supportive with all of Jesse's and my work, and uh, they sell the hard copy, print copy, and also an ebook version of the book. So yeah, it, that would be my first choice of place to buy it. Would be at Bella. Nice. Yeah, do that, everybody. Go because that's where a lot of the authors. It's a home base mm -hmm. for them, at least for distribution. So let's um, keep it where where it counts where we can give a little something back, right? Bella, Bella. Oh, yeah, I, I'm uh, not prejudiced or biased or anything, but Jesse has just become a Bella author. So, well. Bella, Bella. <laughs> and a cheerleader, or at least a chanter. That's that's fantastic. I love it. So um, you can get this. And, you know, this anthology could take on a life all its own. You never know. What else could happen with this anthology with all of that might behind it? Maybe women's studies programs or genre programs uh, for writing all across the country in different colleges might want to buy this book. If you know anybody like that, it would be great if we sold it in packs of them. <laughs> right. Let's get it into curriculum. Yeah, that would be fantastic. And again, if you just want to learn more about Lori Lake and Jesse Chandler, go to their websites. They're so easy. They're their names. JesseChandler.com, LoriLLake.com. Any final words? Don't go to LoriLake.com because she is a Georgia real estate lady. And she's very good about forwarding my mail to me that has come to her, but it must be irritating. So go to Lori L. Lake. Excellent. Lori L. Lake, the triple L. She's a triple threat, folks. LoriLLake.com, JesseChandler.com. Jesse, any final words? Just thank you for uh, the airtime and the fun time and the laugh time and, and the hard chair I'm sitting in. In the very short chair. Jessie is sitting in a, a chair that's about 12 inches off the ground, and she's sitting much lower than Sean Marie and I are. I know. It, we can feel kind of regal. Yeah, she's, It's a Jessie sandwich, too, because that's the way we're keeping warm in this cool little studio. Right. In Oregon. Chilly, chilly Oregon. Thank you so much. You have been listening to Ben's Book. You have been listening to Network Listen's Ben's Book. Want to join the discussion? Drop us a line to words at networklisten.com. Network Listen. We're everywhere you need us to be.